You're not supposed to pray and speak and go with it just to cast this mountain into the sea. Meanwhile, God has placed that mountain there and he has an expectation and he is excited that you're going to climb on that mountain and that you will meet him on the top of the mountain and that you will have an awesome, awesome, awesome time with one another. Like we've talked about the Sermon on the Mount in the season where I believe you allow the Holy Spirit to take you to go and sit with your master and hear his mandate for your life. Welcome. My question to you is, on the mountain where the enemy wants you to worship, are you worshiping there? On the mountain where the devil is coming, and he will take you on that mountain, the devil, and he will show you your vision, he will give you scriptures. On a mountain where you will be reminded about the promises of God, and you're hearing scriptures about the promises of God, but it's you and the devil on the mountain. Because he took Jesus on the mountain and he quoted some scriptures on the mountain. Because this was the reason why Christ came. So that the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God in Christ Jesus, according to the word. So the devil said, here is the kingdoms. Yeah, you can have it. You can take it. it can be yours. Just worship me. Just focus a little bit more on me than on your Father. So you can stand on the promises. You can get the word from the Lord that came from God's mouth. And you can stand on it in such a way that you are focusing so much on those things but not on Him. Who's with you on the mountain? There's a mountain that you need to climb and from that mountain, you need to do a warfare against the enemy and tell the enemy there on the mountain, this is how my life is going to be in the name of Jesus Christ. This nonsense will not happen anymore. This rubbish I will not take anymore. I will not be deceived anymore. I will not be in that place of not knowing how to handle Scripture. But too many times we can get with the enemy up there and the enemy can quote you some Scripture, but you don't know any other Scripture. So the enemy says, this is what God is saying, like Jesus said, but it is also written. It's also written. But do you know enough word? Is there enough word in you that you can say? Also there is written the following. And that you can give perspective to the promises that you are standing on, the words that you have from God, that you can understand perspective, the perspective all around those scriptures that you have, all around those promises that you take, all around the commands or that mandate or that vision that you have. Do you have God's perspective? Because if you have perspective and you know the word in such a way that there's a perspective around the promises, there's a perspective about context, if I can say like that, then the enemy can bring you some scriptures. Your life will be protected. You will be protected because you are in the word. You don't have a scripture. You are found in the word. That means all around you there's word. So the enemy wants to Pick one out, you can bring context. Because you know the word. I challenge you, come into that place to know the word. Come to know the word. Amen? That you will be surrounded by the cloud of witnesses of the testimony of Christ, who he is in your life. And that the word of your circumstances, the word of your success, or whatever is happening around you, those voices cannot be louder because the word is so loud. Because you came to know the word and you don't silence the scripture. Hear me, just hear the sentence and go and have a bride. Don't silence the word and the voice of God because your mind says, I know that. I've heard that before. This ambas was onis. And then it's not alive in you. 
John 3.16, I can quote it here and it can mean nothing. It does not necessarily resonate. It's not necessarily alive in you. Are you with me? Some people, when a beloved died, like there's a dear beloved that died, and they can remember certain things that that mother or grandmother or husband or wife, what he or she said. And that memory lane, some of that memory lane, there's a life with it. It's not just, I remember a word. I remember the sentence that my dad always said. No, you rem around that sentence, you, you remember an experience and you have now an experience because of what you experienced then in the context of relationship. And that's why it's so precious to you, because some of those things that were said was in the context of relationship. So scripture that is said, and, and you studied it, and you got it in your heart in the context of a relationship, that you do the word in the context of relationship, those scriptures will always be precious to you. If that scripture does not resonate in your heart, and I don't say you must jump up and down with every scripture. That's not what I'm saying. But if it's not... Something in your heart that you know, yeah, it's precious. Yeah, I appreciate. I appreciate John 3, 16. It's precious to me. There's something alive with that scripture. Like there's something alive with that memory of that sentence that meant so much to you when your grandfather said that specifically to you. You don't know how much I love you. And that one sentence from your grandpa or your grandma or your husband or your wife or whoever, it's not just sticked with you, if I must use that word. Hello? Oh, uh, I'm, I'm still here and they're all alive. Okay. Are you with me? I challenge you that the word will become so precious to you. I challenge you in that. Amen. On the mountain, on the mountain, when the enemy takes you there, God will allow it because there on the mountain you need to deal with him. When you come down the mountain, you come from a place of victory. It's not, first of all, to deal with him in the valley if you cannot deal with him on the mountain. Because you must come down from the mountain not with confusion. You must come down with clear, clear vision. You cannot come down if you don't know the word. So stay on the mountain. Get the word into your heart. Get the word into your life. How do we say it? You speak it until you believe it, and then you speak it because you believe it. You read it even if it means nothing to you. And the Holy Spirit will open it up. It can mean nothing to you now. But right at that, at that moment, it's just coming alive in you. Whew. Coming alive in you. You know, a uh, pathetic example is the gospel. You know, the pill. You take that specific uh, uh, medicine and it means nothing. It is no impact. And then suddenly at the right time you just feel a certain impact. And you feel healing. I don't believe that medicine is the answer in everything. But it's not, not, definitely not. Say, medicine is from the devil. You must have faith to be healed. Um, no. Both. But if you are stuck behind the one, that's wrong. That's a substitute for faith then. No, you don't, don't go there. Don't know why I had to say that for whoever. I'm just saying, at the end of the day, you must be arrested by his word. Arrested by his word. Not arrested by, circum by the circumstance and then you fight with the scripture. Remember the example? If you know the word, you have the sword, two edges sword, and you know how to cut. That what is soulish, that what is from the spirit. If you don't know the word, you have some plastic Tupperware thingamagoli in your hand and you tickle the devil with your few scriptures that you know and believe and try to remember. No, don't, don't play that type of game. It's a comedy. So please, let your warfare not be a comedy to the devil. Amen. It will not be because you will come to know the word. When he wants to bring a scripture, you just know the answers. He, he, he puts something out of context. You just know context. 
He wants to say something. You just know what God is saying. He wants to say that you just know what God's heart. He cannot get into the place because for some reason you have perspective. For some reason you know Father's heart. For some reason because you know what Father is saying. You know his language. You know his heart. You've seen how he thinks about things. What is his opinion about things? You've seen that in the word. Amen. Okay. I hope you've written down 11 things. Yeah. Be it elf numbers? Ah, I would have given you 10,000 rand. But, uh, <laughs> Miskin Richard. Okay, where are we now? My brother, what mountain? What mountain? What mountain are you on? I want to, yeah, let me go quicker than within the first service. <sighs> There's a mountain that belongs in the sea. There's a mountain where you need to come to worship and offer up Isaac. But you, if you go with a devil on the mountain where you need to offer up Isaac and the devil demands worship and you are there to offer up Isaac, you're going to slaughter your vision. You're going to slaughter people. You're going to kill what you're not supposed to kill. Whatever mountain you're on top of, on that mountain, you need to be sensitive in the spirit. When you're in the valley, this mountain is not from God. You need to be removed and thrown into the sea in Jesus' name. I will not touch this mountain. I will not go on this mountain because this is not from God. This will be removed in front of me. You need to know the difference because too many times we are not aware of the type of mountain that is surrounding us or what is in front of us. There's two testimonies about the Mount Sinai. Moses had a testimony, and the Israelites, they have a testimony. The testimony from Moses about this mountain was, I saw him face to face. I heard the voice of God calling me on that mountain. He spoke to me as a friend would speak to a friend. That's his testimony. I got a mandate from that God, that's my God, that's for the nations of the world. I intercede for God's nation before my God, face to face. I even negotiated with him. When he said, we can go, he's going to bless us. And he said, God, we're not going to go if you're not going with us. I even experienced that and that amazing, 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 amazing experience coming down with a mandate but with the glory of God on his face that the people couldn't look at him. That was his testimony. But then you find another testimony. Other people they were also at the mountain. Exodus 20, verse 18. Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, lightning flashes, sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. This is what they saw. They couldn't see beyond that. Couldn't see beyond thunderings, lightning flashes, sound of the trumpets, smoking mountain. The smoke, the sound, the thunder, the lightning. They couldn't see beyond that and they stood back. So sometimes we can see things in the word. We could see things in the word. And we don't understand. We see smoke. We don't understand. And in our walk with God, it's thundering and it's a lot of noise. And we walk back. And we let things happen. But I'm not interacting with God. I'm not come for, I don't come for interaction with God. I'm standing back and I hear the word in the worship, I have my time here and there, and it's good, and it's okay. 
but me really interacting beyond the smoke, beyond the thundering, beyond the sound. To go beyond that. Because for my flesh, it's too much. And that's where, what did they say based on that testimony? Then they said to Moses, you speak with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. That's your flesh. And say, God, speak to me. I want my flesh to die. I want everything that is not from you. I want that to die. That's why verse 20, and Moses said to the people, do not fear. Everybody say, do not fear. For God has come to test you, and that his fear, his fear, may be before you, so that you may not sin. So that his fear may be before you. But God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. Now what fear is this? There's a fear that is from God, and that it has to do with the respect God came to test you so that his respect will be upon you. Not fear to run away, but fear that I will respect him. When he speaks, I will speak. When he says left, you will go left. I will not reason with him the whole time. But he came to test me. It's not like, actually, God is confused. He does not know what is in your life, so he came to test you. No, he wants to show you what is inside of you. In the testing, it's not so that he don't have to be confused anymore because now he knows what is in you. <laughs> His testing of you is so that you can see where you are at. And that clearance can come of where are we going to, how are we going to get there, and from this place, what must we do? That's why it's called testing, so that you can see where you are at. And from that place, say, okay, God, from this place, I want to walk with you. Out of this, out of this, into that, into that. What you have for my life. Are you with me? He came to test you so that you can be honest and see where you are at. And so that his fear, the respect for him and his hand on your life. God, only you knows. It's only you. I need your guidance. I want to follow you. Why? Because I have respect for you. I will not moan and groan. Because that's what happened. It was this whole Ten Commandments, everything, this whole experience that this man Moses had on the mountain that arrested him. That we don't find that explanation of someone in the presence of God, in any other place in the world. But that same awesome, awesome, awesome open heaven experience for the others. Oh, no, 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 no. It's just smoke. It's just thunder. It's just, whoa, 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 no, no. Don't let, I don't want to come too close. I cannot come into that place. I ask you to have the faith, to have the faith, to take the courage, to push beyond the smoke in your life, push behind, beyond the thundering and the shakings, the artbeerings and the shakings that you feel is shaking your life. No, go beyond it just to be with him. So that from the place you will come with a mandate. You will come down with a mandate. He came down with the Ten Commandments not written by his own hands what he heard. It was all written by God himself. That from that mountain you come down with what God has written on your heart. As the word says, the new covenant. That you come down with the, the principles, the foundations that God has given you, written on your heart. And you will not throw away that mandate. What happened? Here's this man Awesome, awesome experiences with God in his presence. He received the mandate from God, and it's not God giving it to the whole nation. God is giving it to Moses to go and give. You have, my brother, my sister, you have in your hand a mandate from God. And especially if you understood and if you understand how to be with him, 
how to hear his heart, how you allow him to speak to you beyond the smoke and all the thunder and all the stuff, you will walk out with clear mandate from the place of those smoke, smoking thunders. From that place, you will come out with clear, 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 clear mandate. Are you with me? But then in the place of frustration and see what's happening around you, Moses, boom, threw down the mandate. So you can throw it down. You can throw down the mandate. Even if you had the most awesome experiences with God and heard him 100% accurately from his heart. And he wrote it on your heart. He did the work in you. You didn't take notes. He did it. And then you can come and you can crush it. In the name of frustration, in the name of what you see around you, in the place of you feel hopeless in that, and you cannot believe what is happening around you. You just came from this awesome place, and now just see what you need to face. Anybody, you were there, you just had this excellent time with God, you just had this input, you just received all this revelation, and even maybe sometimes in, even in the conference, and you made certain decisions, certain things are just happening for you, and you come in the valley, <laughs> and the temptation is there just to throw it down. And not necessarily, <coughs> you know, but just to drop it. <laughs> you don't make that choice necessarily, but it just happens. Because you let go. It's not like you throw, but you let go. Instead of taking hold, I have, I have a precious, precious, precious mandate from the heart of the Father for my life, for my family, for my future, for the nation, for my business, for that what God has for my life. I have it with me. God did it in me. God did it in me. You know, and the whole thing of Moses must go back and say, uh, Lord, thanks for what you've done. Thank you that you are speaking to me as, as a friend to a friend. Thank you that I could see your glory. Thank you for so much in your presence that I could see so much of you and don't die, and didn't even die. But just as I went out here, I messed up everything that you wrote. Uh, I didn't mess up the golden calf. I messed up your tablets. <laughs> <clears throat> You've been in that place? I've been there. And then you feel a little bit, <clears throat> you go up the mountain a little bit slow. Wondering, how will I approach this situation now with God, you know? I've received so much from him. I've heard so much from him. I had so much in his presence. I know his word in such, I have such precious moments and experiences with him. And how on earth did this happen? That I just threw it down and sat back and not being there cutting edge in that what God has for me and being faithful in that what he has for me. How did that happen? And then you need to face him through the blood of the Lamb. And God's forgiveness is there. And he will go again. And he will go again, and he will start from commandment number one again. And write over the whole thing that you messed up. Because you looked at the circumstances and threw down the tablets instead of kept your eyes on him. And you had so much going for you with God. God's mercy is there. Amen. If today you're sitting here and you know you threw down, down some of the mandate because of the frustrations, because of the things that happened and you didn't, you didn't get the clearance, you had a certain expectation what would happen when you come down the mountain with a with that mandate, with that Ten Commandments, what will you find? The opportunities. <laughs> and when you come down with a mandate, you find the golden calf. What are you going to do? The golden calf is going to speak to you. Are you going to throw down? Or are you going to ask God's wisdom? going to ask God's wisdom. Praise God. 
that even when he saw what he saw, he said, now I need to go back on the mountain. Now I need to go back to God's presence. Moses said, now I need to go back on the mountain. I need to go back and do intercession for you. And he went back on the mountain. You have a mountain to do some intercession. My brother, my sister, that was also the testimony from Moses. That's the place where I could do intercession for his nation. Where he changed his mind about what he thought of doing. Oh, are you with me? Are you with me? Oh, may God help you, my brother, my sister, that you will come from that place with clear 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 mandate and it will be so precious to you what god has written on your heart what god has written on your heart and that you will live according to that now with the law i try to do the 12 points in the first session and i ended at the introduction so i think i'm going to do the same um there's 12 points, but I want to end off with this facet. And that is in the law, most of you know this already, you are under the law, or you are free from the law, or you are in the law. Under the law, you are under the curse, the letter of the law, where you feel, oh, you must do these things, and I must do, and it's even, especially when you're negative or depressed, in that feeling so sorry for yourself, even what happened wrong, at the end of the day, it becomes a selfish cycle where it's actually just about yourself. Even if you feel you failed, in, some, in so much of that feeling that you're a failure, it's a lot about yourself. What about saying, yes, I failed, and let the failure die on the cross. So the failure died with Christ on the cross, but victory is now living in me and he's living through me. His name is Jesus Christ. Amen? If you have respect for him, then what about standing a little bit away from your depression, standing a little bit away from your negativity? If you feel like it or not, your feeling is your Christ, your feeling is the anointed one, let it be so. But I ask you in Jesus' name, maybe you must decide, see how you can deal with that. Amen? Unless you call Christ your failure. But if you don't call Christ your failure, then your breakthrough is already living in you. Hello? I'm asking. If Christ is your breakthrough, then failure is not living in you. So you cannot be a failure because failure died with Christ on the cross. Failure equals you. You are one big failure. That's it. And praise God for the cross. That failure, the fullness of me, called failure, could die with Christ on the cross. Amen? So that I don't live anymore, failure don't live anymore, but Christ, victory, the victory from heaven, the one, the victorious one, where victory has a name, where victory there's life. Victory is alive, and he's living in me. That's the truth. You stand on the truth if you feel like it or not, because you choose to honor him. Why? Don't fear, because God came to test you so that his fear, his respect, his respect will be on your life. The testing is so that you are respecting more than your circumstances, respecting more than the fear to fail, respecting more than anything else. Because as you lift him up, he will give you the breakthrough. But at that place, it's all about him. Are ah, you still with me? He came to test you, to put you in the right place. And what is it all has to do with discipline? Yes, he wants to discipline you because he's your father. And he loves you because he's your father. And he loves you. He knows who you are. He believes in you as his son, as his daughter. Therefore, he disciplines the one that he loves. Amen, amen. How does he discipline? In your time with him? Yes. With the word? Yes. But a lot through people. If you don't have somebody in your life that's speaking to your life, and many times he speaks what you don't like, you are not being discipled. You are not in the pattern that is from him. Because my flesh will not like. 
a discipline to be put in a certain pattern. Unless my flesh is just totally holy. Okay. Call me Jesus. Then discipline is just 100%. But if I'm not Jesus, my flesh, according to the word, with all honesty, is not in a place that he wants to lose the control. So especially when somebody tells me what I must and what I mustn't. What you like is not what you're supposed to like. <laughs> How you see things is not the way it's supposed always to be seen. <laughs> now how? Why? Because God decided, go therefore and I will make disciples of all the nations. No. Go therefore you and you make disciples of all the nations. You go and give them discipline. You put them in a pattern of, for life. And if you do that, and you baptize them in my name, and you teach them all that I've commanded you, then you will see that I am there with you. I will be there when you do that. God, I need to speak to Esther about this thing. Oh, hallelujah. Okay, Lord, I will, I will come not, not with condemnation, not with a pointing of the finger, Maybe she's not going to like it. And <sighs> but I do it because you've promised that as I do, you will be there. You will be there. Disciple, baptize, teach, and see I am there. When you disciple, take the promise of God that he will be there. He will be there. And not fear that you will lo lose a relationship or this or that. Because we all make mistakes in discipleship. Uh, hello? And sometimes we're going to say something not perfectly like Jesus would have said it. Oh, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> and see, fear will be there that it will just be a major crash. No. In Jesus' name, I let that go. Are you with me? I'm talking about mountain experiences with God. When Moses come down and you see the mountain where God wants to be with you, where he wants to give certain foundations for your life. This you will do, this you will not do. This is the way that you will live. But if you're under the law, you will just see all this stuff. How I can get in trouble and how I'm supposed to stay out of trouble. That's when you're under the law. I'm free from the law. We call it in that place of lawlessness. That you can sleep with whoever, you can steal whatever, you can say whatever, you can judge whatever, you can do whatever, because I'm free. And you have a freedom, and there's nobody putting some discipline on you. You're not accountable to anybody about your life. Only when you need something, you call the ATM. Pastor, <laughs> click, click, click. Thank you very much. There we go. But there's a brother, there's a cell leader. There's an elder, there's a pastor, there's somebody that you need to go to and say, speak into my life. Don't just give me nice things. Tell me where I need to change because I am not called Jesus. I'm a human being. And according to the word, I'm supposed to be discipled. I'm supposed to change from glory to glory, from less of me to more of him. And for that, according to the body of Christ and according to the mandate from Jesus, this will only happen if I allow discipleship into my life, but also go and I'm prepared to speak into other people's lives. That's a context of being with God on the mountain, receiving a mandate, Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments. You are commanded not to do this. You are commanded to do that. You just see the command, you don't see God. You will die under the curse of the law. You with me, you with me. And so all these things came and Moses said, so that you will respect him. But then, but then what happened? They tempted God. How? They argued with him. They always had these questions. You know, we can say we wrestle this thing out with God. Are you sure? Maybe you and religion and your perspective about relationship wrestled about something because there's no wrestling with God if you have respect for him. It's not just, I can say what I want and I can 
You must share your heart with God, yes. But you can throw any tantrum. Go in, go in front of your dad and in the presence of whoever. Go and fall down there and throw a major, I won't even ne nearly say a hell of a tantrum. God knows my heart. You know, he knows my heart. I just share my heart with him. And bah, 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 bah. God knows my heart. He accepts me as I am. Ah, there's a yes and there's a no. The first problem, where's your respect for him? Is this the way to behave? You can share, but there's a way that you can share. You don't need to throw a tantrum. There's a way that you can share your heart. Because in that way, you will be able to hear what he has to say. But if you... <coughs> How will you hear his voice? When will you hear in the middle of a sentence where God wants to start to speak? Or if it's only at the end of your sentences, at the end where God needs to wait and he needs to hear it out until you decide you are finished with everything that you had, you had to, sell, to tell him and, and then he's allowed to speak. We will not say it like that. No. But what about sharing my heart with him in such a way that any time that he wants to stop me and say, okay, let me speak, I will be able to hear him. That is talking it out with him. That is bringing your whole heart before him. And yes, in the place of respecting him. Then you can find answers. Then you can be in that place and God can touch your heart. Hello? Hello? If you share your heart with him, if it's negative, if you feel fed up with everything, but you still share it from a place of respecting him, then you will be able to hear any moment when God says, stop, my child, just hear what I want to say to you now. May God help you. May God help me. Don't fear. He came to test you so that his fear will be on you. His fear. Not fear to run away and stand, whoa, 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 Moses. No, fear that will draw you closer and say, I respect you, Lord. What are you saying to me? I respect your voice. God, you came with Moses. Moses has a mandate from you. What are you saying to me? Not just what is Moses. God, God what are you saying to me? And open this up for me, these Ten Commandments, so that I can see your heart in the Ten Commandments. You command me to do certain things because your heart is with me, is for me. Amen? So you stick in that relationship. You stay faithful in that relationship because you respect Him. Not because you like it. This one day things work out and you're there. Other day it doesn't work out, now you're not there. One day you don't feel good, so your relationship with God is gone. It's not about getting it on fire. It first of all is, where's your respect? I will respect my emotions. And according to my emotions, my emotions will dictate how my relationship with you will be. I hope you understand that, Lord. It will be according to how I feel. Let's sit here for another two hours and let's see what happens then. Not that I say it will be sin. Maybe I will be the stumbling block. But I want to say, you won't believe it how those days, they, how they preached eh, for a whole day. I think they preached much better than most of us pastors these days, but for a whole day. And sometimes they just read the word going on for the whole day. And there's the guy, he's falling asleep. <laughs> Boom! Dead! Oh, let's go out, just raise him from the dead, come back in, and we carry on with the sermon. I think then they listened. You know, it's not just the whole idea is not for somebody who died to raise him from the dead. That was just so that he can come back into the service and hear what we, God wants to say. So that he can listen to the sermon further. <laughs> for the teaching what the, uh, the apostles had to give was so important. <laughs> hey, are you with me? <laughs> so may God help us that we will be raised from the dead for those who fall out of windows here. Yes, yes. Okay. I want to end up then. Ten Commandments. 
we're not going to the 12 points. I just want to remind you about the Ten Commandments, what we've talked 79 times in the church already. The heart of God in the Ten. Five is all about, those who were in the first service, don't cheat and speak. Five is all about, okay, you and God. Five is all about you and your brother and your sister. Five is about one with another, one another. And five, first five, about you and him. So the first one, he says, you will have no other gods before me. What is God say? In this relationship, it's me and you and nobody else. Let's say it's about me and him and nobody else. God says this will be a pure relationship. It will be me and you and nobody else. You will Second point, you will worship. You will not build yourself something and bow before him. And I will love those who love me in up to the thousandth uh, generation. It's about love and worship. First one, God said, it's me and you, nobody else. Because I'm a jealous God. Secondly, there will be passion. It will be love. There will be worship. You will be arrested by my beauty. That's the second one. You will love me with a passion. You will be arrested by my beauty and be drawn into that place. That's worship. Third point, between me and you, the Lord says, you shall not use my name in vain. What's that all about? You will respect me. Whatever you say in my name, whatever you say will be with respect. It will come from where? Because on your lip is the overflow of your heart. In your heart, you will always respect me. If you understand, if you don't understand, if you are confused, if your emotions are up and down, doesn't matter your circumstance, the up or the down, the success or failure, whatever. You will always respect me and respect my name. That's point number three of the third of the Ten Commandments. Are you with me? Number four was the Sabbath. Keep the Sabbath. Okay, that's a Saturday, just so by the way. Keep the Sabbath. We are coming together on the first day of the week. Hello? Because the Christians that started to celebrate the Christ that rose from the dead on the first day of the week. Yeah. Bottom line, what is God saying? My time is yours. Yours is mine. I have the final say over your time. If I say it's time to rest, it's red time to rest. Time to to testify about me, so it will be. No, but what did we do? We claimed time, and we gave time a voice. And the voice of time says, there's no time for this, there's no time for that, there's time for this, but I don't find time to do that. Why? Because you've given vo- uh, time a, a authority. You give, gave time a voice to speak to you. And this voice says, what will happen, when it will happen, why this will happen, and why that will not happen, and that's it. But if time belongs to him as a gift from him, he is the voice over my time. He is the voice in the context of my time saying to me, this is what you will do, this is what you will not do. You will take a week with me. You will take time in my word. It's not just uh, a New Year's voornemer. What is a voornemer? Was it good? Resolution. Yeah. Richard, you may die in a galeer it all, yo. Rest. Rest all or lose all. What? <laughs> okay. You guys are with me. <laughs> Hallelujah. May time be a gift from God in your life. And that because you respect him, you will say, God, whatever you say, that goes. Time will never be my excuse because time is an opportunity from him. Amen. Number five. About still me and God. It's about you will respect those around you. Respect your father and your mother. That's the first two that brought you in here on earth. There will be a culture of honor, a culture of respect. The opposite, a culture of judging and opinions. We are entitled to and we have the rights and we entertain and we flirt with our opinions. 
We have the right to just have our own opinions, and they are so valuable to us. I feel good in my opinions. We don't say to ourselves, but we all have our opinions, and we entertain them, and not necessarily his opinion. But his opinion is, if you are right, if they are right or wrong, you respect. Because I died for them. I created him. I created her. The devil and hell didn't create that person. And because God created that person, you will respect him. Because God created him. He can make a mess out of his life, but you will still respect that person. And first of all, your mom and your dad. And if you understand the culture of honor, and by that you are protected from the curse of judging, the curse of you fight the fight in the flesh with people, then you must die in the desert. But if you can honor, I give you a promise, the Lord says, you will inherit your destiny. You will inherit the dream that I have for your life here on earth. You will live the dream that I have for you for your life here on earth, if you understand the culture of honor. And not that you have the right to form just opinions and your own ideas about whoever. May God help you. And that even if there is things with your mom and dad still, not just you forgive them, but they must forgive you for not always honoring them. And may God help you. And Lord, let us pray together about that by telling in your mind, I will never be like my mother or my father. That's a curse. You are calling the curse for your destiny. Now, if it's not for God's grace, without God's grace, you'll be a hundred times worse. But through God's grace and his blood, you could learn from their mistakes. Hello? Is that not what happened for 40 years? Is that not what happened for 40 years in the desert? We had to learn how to fear God. He wanted to put his heavenly respect on our lives. When we said, no, 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 no. God must not speak to us. He actually just wanted to put his respect on us, how to respect him. But instead of that, we, uh, we could moan, we could groan, we could argue with him, we could argue with Moses, and all of those stuff. And now for 40 years, my son, my daughter, you are wandering with us here in the desert because we were so cheeky. We had our issues and we entertained our issues. We entertained our opinions. That's why you are walking with us until mom and dad and grandpa and grandmother and auntie and uncle until we all died. But I'm, if I st I'm still alive, you cannot go into Canaan because we messed up so big. We had so much... Such a lot of opinions and ideas and how led by our feelings and our circumstances that is, oh, what about this and what about that? Oh, oh Lord, where, what? That God said we will not enter. So I'm sorry, my child. We, we messed up in that. But please, 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 when God speaks, you don't moan, you don't argue, you don't question, you just do. And for 40 years, they learned the fear of God. For 40 years, the next generation, hello, for 40 years, the next generation learned the fear of God so that they could become the people that could enter the land, that could take the promises. You with me? That's the five facets of the Ten Commandments about you and God and what he wants to bless you with. Then the five, that's all about you and your brother, you and your sister. So I will use who as an example. Uh, <laughs> Are you Beulah, yes, suppose I'm to laugh. So Beulah, God is saying, so God is saying, number six, thou shalt not kill. So I commanded everybody, they're not allowed to kill you. Your, your life is safe. They're not allowed to kill you with words. They cannot destroy you because life and death is in the power of the tongue. They cannot speak death against you. I've commanded them not to do that. And so for every child of mine, this is now the other five commandments. Why? Because each one of you are very precious. That's why God commands all the rest not to do the following to you. 
You're not allowed to speak death and curses over Beulah. So those says the Ten Commandments. Secondly, thou shalt not commit adultery. Your husband will not be naughty. <laughs> And the relationships will you, that you will have, they will be faithful. They will not, you're not allowed to withdraw your heart from Beulah. It doesn't matter if she has mistakes, if she do you wrong, whatever. You cannot and you're not allowed to withdraw your heart from her. That's just commandment number seven. Commandment number eight, you shall not steal from her. What he says, you will not, you will not steal it from her. Hello? What he says, you will be excited about what she has. You will not steal it. Hello? By putting a focus even more on yourself. When honor is, needs to be given there. Number nine. You shall not give false witness. You will not testify into the wrong about her life. There's things that could be wrong. Yes? But your testimony will be in Christ. About Christ and what he is doing in Beulah and for Beulah and through Beulah. Even though there could be things that are wrong and you are aware of that. Don't fake but your testimony must be according to God's testimony about Beulah. And so you're supposed to be with all the rest. Because that's how God wants to protect every one of his children with all the rest of the family. Because this is how my family will be to you. And lastly, you will not covet. What she has will not be jealous about what she has, and she has this and that, and, you know, and she, she just prayed, and they the palace. Prayed for the palace, and there's the palace. And you're standing in faith and fasting and this and this and sowing and tithing and whatever, and after 30 years, you don't have even 5% of what she has. Huh. How does that work? I'm so excited about what God gave Beulah. Oh, that sounds a little bit, <laughs> we can call it something else. But it's supposed to be that I'm excited about what God has given her. So every success, the rest of you must be excited about that. Every financial breakthrough or every person that just don't know what to do with these millions. Um, but he will hear from God. But what I'm saying is you will be excited about that person. So we're supposed to be excited about one another. And God says, you be excited about one another because I'm excited about you. This is the Ten Commandments. This is how he wants his people to be with one another because among them he wants to live. So he dictates how his heaven will be because his heaven is the nations of the earth. You see, they're not allowed to tell his heaven how his heaven must be. That's you and me. I say you take this if you respect him. If you respect your feeling or your opinion, whatever, leave it. But if you are at Exodus 20, where the mandate, where the Ten Commandments was given, may you not be, may I not be the ones that say, whoa. When, God, when Moses said, no, 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 God wants to put his fear on you. He wants to put his respect on you. The respect that is from him. God, come and do that for our lives, we pray. Lord, even now with communion, we pray that you'll come and wash us clean in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Lord, that we will sort out our hearts, that we will respect your blood, we will respect the forgiveness that you give us, Lord. Come and set us free from ourselves, I pray in Jesus' name. God, I pray for every man, woman sitting here that they will have the capacity to see what mountain is in front of them. Is it the mountain where you call them to the top? Is it the mountain where the enemy takes them? God, is it the mountain that must be removed into the sea? Give us the capacity, Lord, that we don't waste our lives, our energy, that we don't waste our time standing in front of the mountain and miss it all together but God help us to long for more of you in your presence that we will respect your presence and therefore we want to say more of you less of us Lord 
We want to see you. We want to hear your heart. We want you, please, please, Lord, to come and write with your hand on our hearts like you've written that, ten, those ten commandments on those tablets. Come and write your principles. That what is in your heart, come and write it on our hearts, please, Lord. We trust you for that, Lord, and that we will go with mandate into the valley of tomorrow and that we will not crush the mandate. We will not throw it off. We will not ignore it, Lord. But find it precious that every scripture, Lord, that we will come into that place of valuing every word that comes from your mouth. I pray that everyone here Holy Spirit, that you will give them a hunger for the word, a hunger so that they will be surrounded by your word. When the enemy wants to come and bring one verse, one scripture, God, that we will know context. We will have word perspective because we have a perspective from your heart. Protect us in such a way, Lord, and thank you. God, even as you took the bread and you broke it and you said, this is my body that was broken for you. God, that we can be healed, our lives can be healed, not crushed, broken, because you took everything on you. Lord, you took the cup, and you said, this is the New Testament in my blood, drink thereof. God, as we do this this morning, we honor you, and we thank you for the blood, and that the life is in the blood. We don't want a fleshly life anymore, in Jesus' name. Cleanse us. Make our lives beautiful through your blood, Lord, please. We thank you that through communion we can proclaim what you've done for us on the cross. We proclaim your death. We proclaim the message of the cross as we choose to boast in the cross and in the cross alone. So we pray. Let's all say, Amen. Amen.